Ten years ago, Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast of the United States and uh, specifically New Orleans four years ago. A book written by this gentleman came out called Deadly Indifference. He's Michael Brown. He was the FEMA director at the time of Hurricane Katrina. We're also joined by Andy Lester, an attorney. Gentlemen, thanks so very much for stopping by the Oklahoma's Video Studio today. I appreciate it. My Great. pleasure. Great to be and here. And these days you live in Colorado, right? Right. Beautiful and, Colorado. And here you are stopping by back to Oklahoma to sit down and have a conversation. Absolutely. Came to see my good friend, Mr. Lester. And you guys have known each other for uh, just a few weeks, right? <laughs> we were joking beforehand. Yes. Man, I've known him like a third of a century. So you yeah. guys go way back. A long time. But you are an Oklahoma native. Yes. Grew up in Guyman, Oklahoma. Uh, my mom and uh, sister still live there. We still have family across the state. Yeah. Uh, native Oklahoman. Went to school at the University of Central Oklahoma and got his law degree at my alma mater, Oklahoma City University. As I mentioned, you were FEMA director, director of FEMA from 2003 to 2005, I believe. Right. I, I initially went to uh, Washington when the president was inaugurated in 2001 as a general counsel of FEMA. And this was and George Bush. George, yeah, George W. Bush. And I was the general counsel at FEMA from 2001 until, oh, I would say uh, probably very early 2002 after the attacks of 9-11 president appointed me as the deputy director of FEMA, then I became the director of FEMA after that, and then shortly thereafter became the undersecretary of Homeland Security. Uh, Michael, give us the overview of what FEMA does and what it doesn't do. You touched on that quite a bit, and I, and I mentioned the book here, it's Deadly Indifference, uh, written by yourself and Ted Schwartz, but you also define there is a difference uh, between Homeland Security and FEMA, which I believe FEMA is now part of Homeland Security. Is that right. correct? Yeah, I mean, and, and we could go on for days about the, <laughs> the merger of FEMA into Homeland Security, but I, I think people have a misconception about FEMA that it, that it owns planes, trains, and automobiles, and that when something really bad happens, that FEMA is going to swoop in, and they're going to save your life, and they're going to stop the damage to your property, and then they're going to reimburse you for everything that happened that went wrong. And you wrote and, in the book, people think it's you know, uh, the, the Marines landing somewhere with right. parachutes and whatever. You're actually not that, you don't have that much of a staff to do that. It's not that at all. In fact, FEMA, FEMA there's, today there's probably more than 200,000 employees in the Department of Homeland Security, full-time employees, and there's probably around 3,000 full-time employees in FEMA. Now, there, obviously we can ratchet up and there can be you know, tens of thousands of employees depending on what you need, but, but FEMA is a very small organization. And, and, and I would put it this way, FEMA's like, FEMA, FEMA is two things. FEMA is this great orchestra con conductor that primarily coordinates all of the rest of the federal government when something bad happens. And FEMA has probably the most powerful thing in the federal government, and that's a checkbook. And that's the ability to write a check to other departments and agencies to reimburse them to do things for FEMA in cases of disaster and also in a very minimal and in a very narrow way help people financially during during disasters. I mentioned he was FEMA director 2003 to 2005. You guys uh, did a lot of pre-planning for disasters. You mentioned Hurricane Pam. Uh, right. Tell us about that uh, exercise if you will. Well I, I was very surprised when I um, after I became the director of FEMA that we had the organization which was formed in 1979 primarily to prepare for a thermonuclear laydown in case of, you know, old communist Russia attacking sure us. That back in the Reagan days. Right, sure. exactly. Um, there, was, there was no true planning for what we call catastrophic disasters. Now, I understand that if your house burns down, that's catastrophic for you. That if there's a flood, if there's a tornado that, that hits, you know, southwest Oklahoma City or more, that it's catastrophic for that area. But that's not the way we define a catastrophic disaster. We had not done the kind of planning for a disaster where you have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that are displaced and homeless, where you have communications that cover a 90,000, 100,000, maybe an entire state uh, square miles wise, where all of those communications are down, where you cannot get um, transportation facilities in, you can't get people in or out. Uh, think about the big one hitting California. Uh, there was, a, you know, The Rock did a recent movie called San Andreas. It was a little over the top, but uh, there were some things in there that were true. Hard to believe that would be the case with The Rock. Right? I know, but I know, sure. it's, it's hard to imagine that. But, but many of the underlying and underpinning themes of that movie were correct. 
hundreds of thousands of people displaced, no communications, no way to get commodities, you know, milk, water, bread, cheese, whatever it might be, in to feed people. We had never done that kind of planning. So I went to Congress. Did and that I, surprise you? I was shocked by it. Some of this does seem like it would be a little bit common sense that this conversation might have come up at some point. But you were surprised you went to Congress. I, I, I was surprised. I went to Congress. I, I uh, begged, borrowed, and stole some money from just some different organizations to, to put together a scenario for seven different events that might occur and then to start the planning for those just to, I mean, the whole idea of planning is to find out what might work and what won't work, and most importantly, what won't work. So we did the planning, and the first one of those seven scenarios, I mean, I, I, maybe it's important to understand what the seven scenarios were. And you guys really defined that from not necessarily terrorism, but it was more of recurring things like earthquakes, tornadoes, things like that, correct? Right, that's correct. I mean, you have, you have both natural and man-made disasters. And, and so, for example, we went from the, from the most bizarre, but yet still a real possibility of an electromagnetic pulse, a, a you know, the, the Islamic Republic of Iran decides to explode a nuclear device uh, over, say, the Washington-New York corridor at 40,000 feet or 100,000 feet. Well, that would just take out all of the electronics, what does all that communications. Out? And then, furthermore, what's the effect of that? And what's the effect of that? So we went from the, all of those kinds of scenarios all the way to uh, a Category 5 hurricane hitting New Orleans. And that was... Because you guys identified that that would be the, the largest, biggest city that would be most likely to be hit from a hurricane, although I think you also considered the East Coast up north as yes, well. Yes, we, we considered all those things. We identified New Orleans as, let's exercise that first because we know we have levees that are, you know, hundreds of years old that have been poorly maintained. Most of New Orleans sits below sea level and in a fishbowl. So we decided to exercise a response to that kind of disaster first, uh, and, we, and we call that exercise Hurricane Pam, just a random name picked. And long story short. Could have been Hurricane Andy. Could have been Hurricane <laughs> Andy, probably should have been Hurricane <laughs> Andy. So, so we, we, we do this exercise, uh, we go through you know, the planning, we hire contractors, we put together the, the plan and the exercise, and we go to a couple of tabletop exercises. One is in December, I think, of 04, and then the next ones are in July of 05, which is a month before Hurricane Katrina strikes. And in July of 05, we shut down the exercise because we find that New Orleans, uh, the city of New Orleans, Orleans Parish, and most of the surrounding area is so dysfunctional and so ill-prepared that we can't even conduct the exercise, so we shut the exercise down. That's got to be some bad foreshadowing. Um, it was a it was an incredible eye opener to us because we suddenly realized that uh, for decades we have dodged a bullet in New Orleans, and now we need to figure out how can we, as the federal government, help the state of, of Louisiana be prepared for this kind of disaster. What happened, and then why did you write this book? Well, what happened is, is that a month later, about six weeks later, Hurricane Katrina strikes. And ironically, Hurricane Katrina was not a Category 5. Hurricane Katrina was a 5 in the Gulf of Mexico. It downgrades as it approaches the coast. And what really devastated New Orleans was the storm surge, that once the hurricane passed New Orleans, the storm surge, as the winds swirl around, the winds push the water. And I don't think people, I mean, people in Oklahoma should understand this. You've seen flash floods here before. But storm surge is an amazingly powerful force. So those storm surges come back across Lake Pontchartrain, start to fill the canals. The canals fill up, and the levees begin to breach. And once the levees breach, water will reach equilibrium, which means that it will continue to spill into that fish bowl until it reaches equilibrium and, and the water levels out. You mentioned in the book Tampa is built somewhat the same way, except Tampa is above ground. If Tampa floods, the water comes back out. New Orleans, it floods, the water stays in. And that's an incredibly important point that people don't understand. We had, the year before, we had Hurricane Charlie, which just barely missed Tampa. Uh, actually hit Punta Gorda south of um, Tampa, St. Petersburg, and even the storm surge in St. Petersburg came in uh, to the inlet, but it goes right back out because 
That's just what water does. And in Katrina, it filled the canals, it began to flood, and it continued to flood until those breaches were stopped. And, and, and most importantly, you can't stop those breaches overnight. That takes time. And the biggest point was the levees hadn't been maintained over the years, as it turns out? Well, it's, um, I mean, to be brutally honest, the, uh, the levy boards are local districts, like a, I would call them the equivalent of like a local school board. Uh, they're a local subdivision of the, of the parishes. They receive millions of dollars in grants for maintenance and for improvements. Most of that money was either misspent, uh, who knows where that money went. The levees were poorly maintained and the levees were, I, I can remember standing on top of one of the levees where it had breached and looking out across the levee and, and, and imagine, imagine a, a, a stereotypical Nichols Hills home and within stone's throw from that levee where it had breached is this home which you would find in Nichols Hills. So you're thinking, why build there? And I'm wondering, not only why would you build there, but why would you as a citizen not be interested in what your levee board is doing to make certain that that water that's protect, that wall that is protecting your family and your property from a catastrophic event, why would you not be caring about what they're doing with the money. The levees are pretty impressive. I mean, they're, they're, they're massive structures built for a specific reason, but they do have to be maintained and right. they can wear down. Right. Talking with uh, Michael Brown, former female director, he's the author of this book, Deadly Indifference. Came out in uh, 2011, or published in 2011, an Andy Lester attorney. Deadly Indifference, in indifference is kind of what you're talking about there. The house built right next to the levee, you're indifference because it actually never affects me, it never happens. That's kind of your theme throughout this book, is there was some indifference in this case as well. There is, uh, we worked hard on that title, trying to think of what really encapsulated the message we were trying to get across. And there was not one disaster that I went to where I didn't hear from an American citizen, I never thought it would happen to me. And that indifference, that, that belief that, I mean, look, we're sitting in a beautiful studio, we got a beautiful building here in downtown Oklahoma City, um, and, and even though we have, we have all seen what terrorism can do to a city, downtown Oklahoma City, for example, and I, I, I know all of the, the historical belief that you know somehow we're protected by an, an, an Indian and a Native right. American it's tribal ground belief, somehow. tribal ground somehow it's going to protect us. We believe that somehow nothing bad will ever happen in downtown Oklahoma City, and it may not, and I hope it never happens in our lifetime or anyone's <laughs> lifetime, but. Bad things happen. Mother Nature is going to do what Mother Nature is going to do. Bad actors, terrorists, are going to do what they're going to do. <laughs> and I think that we, we live in this wonderful world where we've got great air conditioning, we've all turned our telephones off, we have our iPads, our computers, we've got televisions. We, we live in a society where we think we're invulnerable. And that creates this attitude of deadly indifference, that we don't think anything bad can happen to us. He mentions Oklahoma at the end of this book, and you live in Colorado, and you mention, hey, Colorado is, is prone to some wildfires, just like Oklahoma is prone to some, some tornadoes. And you're right, there is a little bit of indifference there. It's like, oh, I'll take my chances. I like Oklahoma, but you realize. Well, you'll do like I did. You used to go chase them. What you do in Oklahoma, <laughs> that's right? right? That's right. We chase the tornadoes. <laughs> yeah, there's going to be a tornado. Hey guys, you want to get in the get in the truck and <laughs> Let's go? Get in the truck and go. Andy, you read the book. He uh, he named some names here. Your thoughts? Well, there. Uh, in terms of disasters, obviously uh, Michael's the expert on that. Um, the the you know, what happened afterwards is a fascinating story as well. Uh, Michael became sort of the pinata uh, uh, for everybody to to complain about what went wrong. Um, it took, it, it, was, it was an, in, that, that post-storm uh, political debate was an interesting story itself and it, it took several months uh, before finally all the things people were complaining that Michael supposedly didn't do, uh, we were able to show with some videotapes of, of conversations that actually happened, that he did do. Um, it's interesting to me that, that when we get into a uh, a situation like Hurricane Katrina, people are always looking for somebody to blame, and there's got to be that sort of sacrificial uh, lamb, I suppose. Um, that's what happened there. Uh, it was, uh, I've seen it happen before, we've seen it happen since then. Uh, it was a particularly uh, uh, 
uh, unfortunate uh, way that it happened in uh, post Hurricane Katrina to focus it on on one person. Uh, fascinating thing was it seemed to be a bipartisan type of uh, event. It seemed to involve uh, the media, uh, involved lots of people trying to focus blame on one person, and then nobody else took any responsibility for any of what went wrong. That was wrong as well. They had their scapegoat. They certainly weren't going to jump into that fray, right? Well, uh, uh, yes, and and it was it was I suppose helpful for everybody to have a scapegoat. Except the truth of the matter is, when you have the scapegoat and you don't actually find out what the real problems are, you don't solve whatever whatever the issue might be. There were some problems in in the response to Hurricane Katrina. Um, doing investigations to basically to blame one person isn't the way to solve those problems. And that's what happened there, unfortunately. Michael, you admitted in the, in the book you criticized your own performance, failed to be ready for the media, too timid in response. But what was the effect of being the scapegoat on you personally? Uh, tr truthfully, it was devastating. Uh, it, um, uh, people, people see one individual on the television screen and they, don't, they, they forget that uh, that individual has a spouse, has children, has no grandchildren at the time. Has has a mother and a father has uh, you know a, a mother-in-law and a father-in-law. They have friends. They have relatives. Uh, it was it was probably the most devastating, and at the same time, for me personally, humiliating, because I had gone to Washington with with grand ideas of I think every public servant goes. You've been asked by your president to serve, so you go and you want to. You want to fix things. You want to make things better. Uh, as, as, a con, as a conservative, you want to make sure the government works as best that it can, uh, as efficiently as it can. And then to suddenly to have the entire world look at you and say, you're the most vilified individual. Uh, everybody hates you. Uh, people blame you for the deaths of people. It was truly, um, it was, it was, the, low, it was the, the low point of my life. Uh, it, it was that point where there were only two or three places to turn. You, you turn to your family, you turn to your faith, and you turn to your best friend. I can't imagine dealing with something at that level. That's got to be really hard. I mentioned you named some names. You weren't a big fan of the New Orleans mayor or the governor from what I could gather. And, and I remember uh, during this, the one thought I had in my mind 10 years ago is, why didn't they evacuate? But that was the message you were behind the scenes asking as well. Not only, but, prompt. right? Not, and to this day, it, it fascinates me, in in a sick sort of way, I guess, a fascination that the governor and and the mayor would not either heed our heed our advice, nor themselves do what people had elected them to do, and that is to lead. So, so I turned to another Oklahoman, Max Mayfield, who so was the Center, who right? was the director of the National Hurricane Center at the time. And I said, Max, we, can't, we cannot get this mayor and governor to, to move. So on the next video conference, we have, we have these secure video conferences. Um, I said, on the next one, the president's going to be there from Crawford. Uh, we'll have the mayor, we'll have the governor, and, and we'll have all the governors of the surrounding states. But here's what I need you to do, Max. I need you to describe to them in, in the most harsh terms you can what will happen if this hurricane remains a Category 5? So Max comes on and, and basically paints the bleakest picture you can. And, and afterwards, I reach out to the governor and the mayor and ask them, uh, we're now past the 72-hour window. We have a 72-hour window we recommend people evacuate or at least start the evacuation procedure. We're now within that window, and it's beginning to narrow every hour would you please evacuate the city, start the evacuation process? And the word comes back to me that the mayor is, um, no offense to lawyers, but the mayor is dawdling with his lawyers, worried about liability. And so I make a decision at that point that the, the smartest, the, the, the only thing I can do, I, I can't order an evacuation of a city. Uh, the President of the United States at the time could not order the evacuation of the I city. I thought that was interesting. You went into the authority of who was running the show at this point. It's ultimately the governor running that state and the mayor running that's that right. city. That's, that's exactly right. We, we have a concept in this country called federalism. And, and the President of the United States, uh, primarily based on post-Civil War laws, can't just send the U.S. military. In, can, you know, 
just I'll, I'll put it in stark terms. Can you imagine the president of the United States currently, because something's going on in downtown Oklahoma City, just sending in the 82nd Airborne because he doesn't like what's going on? Well, you can't do that. We have Posse Comitatus, we have the Insurrection Act. So I do what I can do. I do the only thing I can do. Um, you have to remember, this is 2005, so we don't have this plethora of news stations and all these outlets and social media. So I go on to the cable news channels and, and say in the, in the bluntest terms possible, being the Okie that I am, that if I, lived in Oklahoma, that if I lived in New Orleans, I'd be getting my butt out of there as fast as possible. You mentioned the media. You devote two chapters at the end of the book, and again, the book Deadly Indifference, to the media and uh, some challenges that you faced from the media there, and they, they certainly were uh, taking their shots. They wanted to get on the boats to go into the various houses that were flooding. You were like, no, we actually need space on those boats to pull people out of there. But you mentioned at the end you might have done something different in handling the media. I, I think the most, one of the most important lessons that, I, that I've learned and that, that Andy really helped me not just learn that lesson, but I, I'm now able to lecture and teach around the world about this, is the media is, whether we like it or not, is an inherent part of what goes on in our everyday lives. So we have to learn uh, how to use the media, not to manipulate, not to control, but how to use the media, in, in, particularly in the case of a disaster, how to use the media to get the message out, how to use the media to really explain what's going on. Uh, and, and, I, and I absolutely failed in that regard. Very interesting. I, I think you're right about that, the whole what's going on type thing. That lessens the fear, if nothing else, right off the bat. Hey, hey we're handling this, we've got help on the way, or perhaps some details. Um, these days, now you're in Colorado. What are you doing these days? You have a radio show. Well, I have, I have a radio show. I have started a second book uh, that I am plotting through very, very slowly. Uh, also about Katrina or something else? No, about something else. It's about the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. It is the largest reorganization of the federal government since the 1940s when we put together the Pentagon. And, and no one has done that history. I was very fortunate uh, to, be a, to have been appointed by President Bush as one of the four transition leaders to put the department together. So I have all the documents and the memos and the discussions, all my notes about the creation of that monstrosity, which, which frankly I opposed during the pre-decision the pre discussions. Uh, so I'm, I'm working on that, uh, the history of, of that, that department. It affects our lives today in, in both good and bad ways. And I now lecture and speak um, all over the world. I just returned from the Middle East. Uh, I speak to Fortune 500 companies. I speak to small, small companies. I, I am. And what do you talk to them about? Uh, it, it falls into one of two general categories. It's either about leadership and personal resilience. The, the, the ability that once you have, Andy describes it this way, um, after Katrina we were at zero. We were at, 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 my life was at zero. And through resilience I have rebuilt my life and am very successful at what I'm doing today. So that's a story that applies to anyone in any organization or in any family. So I talk about that. But I also talk to companies, governments, uh, trade associations and others about the whole concept of preparedness. Uh, not to pick on you guys, but I bet the Daily Oklahoman, I bet you think you guys are so prepared. You give me a day, I could pick your, I could pick your preparedness apart in a New York minute. I mean, we had a fire alarm not too long ago. We're like. <laughs> Is it, we're still under construction here. Is this legit or not? <laughs> no. yeah, it's, it's silly little things silly like little that. Silly little things, right. Yeah. And people stood around and said, nah, I bet it's not Do we? Do we? Let, yeah. Let's go outside right. just in case. Yeah, just know? in case. When you hear him writing a new book, do you think, oh, there's red flags here. I need to sit him down and make sure, or go for it. Not at all. Michael's one of the easiest clients I've ever had to deal with. <laughs> uh, I mean, he's, you know, he's been through a lot. Uh, he had been through a lot before we ever got to Katrina, and we've, we've say we've known each other for 30 some odd years. Um, you know, when, when, when he was testifying before Congress and I was there with him, I never worried about what he was going to say. It wasn't, the, you know, I, that just wasn't a concern. He does a great job with it. He did a great job with that book. Um, you know, it's, uh, I, we talk a lot. We talk about all sorts of different issues, but uh, never, never worried about what he's going to say. He's going to say it like he sees it. I know that, and 
and usually I think he sees it the right way. I think I, I, Andy's glossing over something. Um, my, my wife will tell you that my career, uh, I always wanted to be a lawyer, but I wasn't sure how I was going to use that law degree. And, and my career has been, uh, I think, one of the most fascinating. I, I, I can't imagine it being any different. I have done some fascinating things, and along the way, I have, I have done what people have asked me to do, and then people have decided that, oh, well, he's actually doing what we want him to do. We're not sure we want that done. And when, when that's resulted in litigation or legal issues or problems, I've always turned to Andy. And I, th I think you would say we've had some fairly that's fascinating. A pretty good we've had some fascinating times together. We have, and you know, for example, when when we got to well, this post Katrina, all these all those issues, uh, we've been through some pretty difficult battles before together. Uh, I first got involved with the Hurricane Katrina stuff uh, basically from the media office at uh, FEMA. FEMA was getting all these questions about Michael's background. He'd been the commissioner of the Arabian Horse Association. Uh, we heard he got fired from that job. We heard this, we heard that. And of course, this, the stories that they heard, other than the fact he was the commissioner of the Arabian Horse Association, the rest of what they were reporting simply wasn't true. Um, we went through. Michael was hired at that at the Arabian Horse Association, and, and this would be like being a commissioner of, say, Major League Baseball. Um, he got hired uh, to do a job to clean up the business. That's what he did. Um, he ended up having to uh, prosecute the number one uh, Arabian horse trainer in the world. Probably doesn't make that many friends doing that. <laughs> no, and you know, the number one Arabian horse trainer in the world is backed by uh, people worth literally of billions of dollars. Um, this is not an easy thing to do. Uh, but he was able to successfully prosecute that person. We went through that battle together, and it was a battle. Uh, it was a tough battle. So, you know, no, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm never too worried about what he's, how he's going to handle things. But we won. Make sure you point out we, we absolutely actually won. won. <laughs> you weren't a big fan of time uh, either. You, you go into some uh, so in depth about that reporting. I have two questions for you, both involving. Well, can, I tell you about, can I tell you about the time? Just absolutely. Because I think I think that. First of all, Andy will tell me to get over it, but to me, that's the the one thing. Because the whole, they dug into some of your background, and you're like, "No, that's not true." Right, uh, that's that's not true. Which but, actually but, involves Edmund. Right, but 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 imagine that you're you're handling what at the time, and I think still is probably true, the largest natural disaster in American history, and you you are the you're pulling the strings, and you've got uh, I, I've got a staff that covers like six or seven states. We've, I've got six or seven governors I'm dealing with. I've got the president that I'm dealing with. All these things going on. And my press secretary comes to me and asks me for a copy of my resume. Mr. Brown, can we get your resume? What? <laughs> what? Right. right. I, I'm thinking, and I just say no. I don't have time for that. What I should have said was, well, yeah, you can call the White House Office of Personnel. You can call the CIA. You can call the FBI. Probably someone they, who has it right, on file. Right. They, they, they all have it somewhere because I, I have all these top secret clearances and everything else. And time proceeds with this story that's just full of absolute untruths. And of course, at this point, I realize that this is out of my control, and I do a lateral <laughs> over to Mr. Well, Lester. And, and, the, and they gave, gave you 45 minutes <laughs> 45 to minutes. respond. You're in the middle of dealing with this horrific disaster. Time gave Michael 45 minutes to respond, or they're going live with the story. And the story um, that eventually came out, I believe, a week later. Well, the story came out that day. On the, on, it came in the news in the but magazine. But a week after the, print the hurricane edition. hit, or within yes, a week. Yes, that's after correct. The and and the story was frankly a lie. And when people have asked me what part of the story was untrue, I say, well, start reading at the beginning, read to the end. That's the part that was untrue. It was verifiably false. We were able to gather the documents. We put the documents into the congressional record. They're there today for anybody, for anybody to see. And uh, but you know, by that time, it's too late. All right, two questions for you. I'll get you out of here on this. Yeah, and I, I want to thank you all for. And Brownie, you're doing a heck of a job. <laughs> the FEMA director is working 24. You're on video. Uh, President Bush is there. Brownie, heck of a job. What was going through your mind? Because you kind of grimaced there. <laughs> I, I actually love telling this story because I, uh, the president was, the White House was very good about reaching out to me before they would come to a disaster area because they wanted to make sure that, I mean, when the president travels, 
the, the bubble is, uh, is amazingly large and it's amazingly disruptive. So White House advance would always reach out and say, when and where should, should we come? And they, they want to come down and I'm all for it because the president needs to see because I'm not getting the cooperation from the other departments and agencies that I need. So I'm like, yes, I need, I need the president down here now. So the plan is we're going to meet at an Air National Guard base in Alabama, or I think it was Alabama. And I told the chief of staff I need to sit with the president for at least 10 minutes so I can give him a heads up, one, about what he's about to see, that he's walking into a buzzsaw. The don't thing, want him to be blindsided. Right, don't want him to be also... blindsided. All these things are going wrong. And, and, and most importantly, here's what I need him to say when he walks in front of those cameras. So... Air Force One lands, we get, into the, we get into the holding room. I start talking to President Bush about what's going on. We get disrupted by, because the media is ready to go. We're trying to stick, stick to a schedule. We're dragged out of the room before I have time to tell him all the things I need to tell him. And we're now doing the photo op. And Bob Riley, who was the governor of Alabama at the time, a former congressman, a friend of mine, um, and. We were doing a great job in Alabama. We were doing a great job in Mississippi. We were doing a so-so job in, in Louisiana. But Mississippi and Alabama were quite happy with the response. And people forget, too, just as a parenthetical, people forget the devastation in parts of Mississippi was as bad or worse than Louisiana. Miss, Mississippi actually got hit really hard. That, Very hard. That governor. Uh, governor Barber. He evacuated. He evacuated. He also said, shoot, right. shoot the looters. That's right. Governor Barber did exactly what he needed to do. So we're in this photo op. We've got uh, Governor Riley from Alabama, Governor Barber from Mississippi, uh, the president and myself, and there's other people, you know, it's, it's the typical gaggle, people standing around. And Bob Riley, in the middle of this photo op, says, and by the way, I, Mr. President, I want to thank FEMA because they're doing a great job in Alabama. The president and I had a great relationship, and we, we you know, I, I had the nickname, uh, been, in, been inside the bubble, been alone with the president on numerous occasions, talking about serious issues, so we had gotten to know each other pretty well. The president, as was his style, turned to me and slapped me in the gut and said, and Brownie, you're doing a heck of a job. And if you watch that, you see me kind of, mm, mm, <laughs> because I knew two or three things. I knew instantly that the media would be curious, who's this guy and why does he have a nickname? How can the president be so out of touch with what's going on? And is Brown even talking to Bush about what's happening? And so I grimaced at that very moment because I knew that, I didn't know it was the death nail, but I knew it was bad. It was missing some context for sure. Mm -hmm. Totally missing context. You mentioned uh, Mr. Bush. Uh, I noticed in here you talk pretty highly of Jeb Bush, of the way he handled Florida and their hurricane preparedness. And I'll segue a little bit here, your thoughts on him as a presidential candidate. Uh, Jeb and I remain friends to this day. In fact, we just exchanged emails uh, over the weekend. But Jeb and I don't see eye to eye on policy. Uh, Jeb's politics. Jeb is conservative, but Jeb is, we just don't see eye to eye on politics. And I think what's important about that is I think in America we've lost the idea that we can actually have political differences and still be friends. So Jeb and I are a great example of that. We. Like I said, we just emailed each other over the weekend, but I mean, if he's the nominee, I'll vote for him. But in the primary, I'm still keeping my options open. I was in New Orleans just last weekend. Spent Sunday night listening to some jazz at Preservation Hall, Monday night, some late night beignets over at Cafe Du Monde. Uh, it, it is a fascinating city. Um, and I, one of my tour guides was, was talking about how the levees and, you know, I kind of got the same story before reading your book about that and how they. They failed, and she rebuilt and stayed there. New Orleans is a great city. Michael Brown, former FEMA director, and along with Andy Lester, attorney. Guys, thanks so much for stopping by. I enjoyed the conversation. This is a good read. It's Deadly Indifference. Uh, you can find it at your bookstores. You can probably find it at Amazon, online. Uh, Mr. Brown, his radio show, KHOW in Denver. Gentlemen, thank you again. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you.